I say good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is truly another blessed day, and we are in for another treat. As we study another installment of Jesus Christ's gospel. Because Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek, the unbelievers. Today we will do our final installment on the study of the gospel as recorded by John Mark in the book of Mark. And we'll be looking at today how Jesus' resurrection should affect us. However, before we move further into the study, let us go to scripture followed by prayer. And it reads, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Shalom, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Let us pray. Father, now, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you that you sent Jesus, transported him down through 42 generations. We thank you that you chose a peasant girl named Mary as the portal by which you brought Jesus to us. And we thank you for the 33 years that you allowed Jesus to be with us. And we thank you that you knew that we of our own volition could not save ourselves. We thank you that you allowed Jesus to go on the cross as our partial and sacrificial lamb. As John recognized him when he said, Behold the lamb of God who is coming, who has come to save the world. And we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. We thank you for the crucifixion. And we thank that Jesus Christ consented to going through all the trials and sufferings that we would have life and have it more abundantly. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen, and thank you, Lord. Today, under the heading, How Jesus' Resurrection Should Affect Us, we will look at three subheadings as we navigate this study. We will look at the resurrection should prompt 
rededication. That means we should rededicate and redirect our lives with a greater focus on Jesus. Number two, the resurrection should provide confirmation. The resurrection should provide confirmation. And number three, resurrection should produce determination. The resurrection should produce determination. Amen. Today, we come to the most important event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the absence of the resurrection, there would be no salvation, as we read in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal and everlasting life. The resurrection is the foundation of the Christian faith. i say that again. The resurrection is the foundation of the Christian faith. As Paul said, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as Christians, uh, saved Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 said, And if Christ had not been raised, your faith doesn't mean anything. Your sins have not been given. So therefore, Christ had to have risen from the dead that our sins would be forgiven. That we would have complete justification when he died meaning that just as if we had never sinned before. Today, we will look, amen, at three ways. We will look at three ways in which the resurrection of Jesus Christ affects our lives to maintaining disability and godly living of mankind. Our first heading. The resurrection should prompt rededication. The resurrection should prompt rededication. The resurrection should motivate us to rededicate and daily recommit our lives to Jesus Christ and the Word of God. The Sabbath having ended on Saturday evening, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Shalom have prepared spices to anoint Jesus' body as they were not satisfied with the best efforts of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Of course, they did their very best. But these ladies loved Jesus much, especially Mary Magdalene, from whom Jesus had cast seven demons from her body. However, on the way to the tomb, they had one looming question. Who can they employ to roll away 
the stone weighing several hundred pounds. I said several, but several hundred pounds from Jesus' tomb. Who would be there to do that? The ladies arrive at the tomb as they were still pondering. But when they arrive at the tomb, the stone has been rolled away. And they did not question them and say who did it, but they saw that the stone had been rolled away from Jesus Christ's tomb. Ain't God good now? They entered the tomb out of curiosity, and when they went, when they looked into the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe. And scripture said, one said, brighter than any fuller could brighter, I mean, uh, than any laundromat, laundry could white that robe. It was white. It was, he was glistening as bright as the sun. But he was sitting, a man, in the tomb of Jesus, where Jesus no longer is. This young man, being an angel, informs them, Jesus has risen and has gone to Galilee as he informs his disciples before he was crucified. The angel directs them to go to Galilee to tell Peter he, Jesus, would meet him in Galilee. See, Jesus told them earlier that he would be in Galilee, but so many times when the word is preached, we are not listening. And many times when we pray and God asks our prayers, we don't get to answer our prayers many times because we are not listening. Sometimes we focus upon our agenda and what we want, and we pray sometimes and fail to pause. We said amen before we have listened to what God's response to our prayer really is. No matter what we have done, God's grace is greater than any sin we commit. His grace is greater than any sin that we commit. Now, what is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. It was God blesses us when we really don't deserve his blessing. God forgives us many times when we don't even deserve for him to uh, turn his face away from our sin. But listen to these words Paul spoke to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.13. Even if we are not faithful, he will remain faithful. He must be true to himself. You hear what he just said? He said, even if we are not faithful, Jesus is going to remain faithful anyhow. He's not going to base his faithfulness based upon how much and how deep we believe. The ladies are frightened, and out of fear, they turn away, not speaking to anyone. The apostle John informs us, Mary ran and runs and tells Peter and John that Jesus' body is missing from the tomb. Peter and John, out of curiosity, they get up and they run to the tomb, finding it empty. Peter and John, being uncertain and perhaps fearful, return to their hideout from the Roman authorities and the Sanhedrin council. Because they had abandoned Jesus a man when the Sanhedrin and other rulers and and and, and uh, Judas Iscariot had come to get Jesus, they went into hiding. 
although Peter was at the trial of Jesus, but the rest went into hiding. And Peter would later join them in their place of seclusion and hiding. So when Peter and John had seen the empty tomb of Jesus, scriptures say, John 20 and 10, say, then the disciples went back to their homes. They went back to their secluded place where they deemed it a safe place away from the authorities because they were fearful that they would meet the same fate as Jesus had met at Calvary. During that time was not the best time for any man to say they were taking a stand for Jesus. Amen. But Peter and John left the tomb. But Mary did not go back with Peter and John after she had informed them. Mary remained at the tomb. Now, scriptures say that Mary looks in the tomb this time and Mary sees two angels. One, gospel say one was at the foot where Jesus had laid and one was at the head where Jesus had been laying, would have been laying. The angel asked Mary, why is she crying? And Mary informs them, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where he is. Mary was concerned about Jesus because Mary had earlier anointed Jesus' head, a man, uh, with expensive perfume or worth thousand dollars, and it was done, Jesus said, in preparation for his coming burial. Amen. Amen. Resurrection for pride, confirmation. So here, Mary turns away from the tomb just momentarily. And she turned away, if one gospel reads, she finds Jesus standing, a man, behind her. However, she does not immediately recognize Jesus, a man, in his new resurrected body and persona. So Jesus, in one gospel, calls her name. He said, Mary. And Mary responds saying, Rabboni, which means rabbi, a uh, master teacher. She did not fully discern Jesus' physical appearance, but the tone of his voice was familiar to us, to her, and that's what enabled her to say, Rabboni, a master teacher. Jesus then directs Mary to tell Peter and John he would see them in Galilee as he had told them before the crucifixion. When Mary told the disciples she had seen Jesus' mild records, but when they heard that he was alive and that be seen by her, they would not believe it. They would not believe it when she had told them that she had seen Jesus. First she told them that Jesus' Bible was missing, but now she's coming to tell them, I have seen the Lord with my own eyes. I've had a conversation with the Lord with my own mouth but for some reason they didn't believe although Jesus told them that he would meet them in Galilee Mary has that special connection to Jesus as he had cast seven demons from her body Mary when she saw Jesus at Mary and Martha's house, she ministered to Jesus as she went and she was at his feet crying. And she took in the tears that 
flowed from her eyes. She washed Jesus' feet with the tears from her eyes. And she dried his feet with the locks of her hair. Jesus, after leaving the tomb, he's on his way to Galilee. He meets two men on the Emmaus road. Jesus leaves these men, and Jesus would later arrive in Galilee. In Galilee, he meets ten of his disciples as they were eating a man, an evening meal in their place of seclusion in Galilee. Now, you said there were eleven left, but how are there ten there, a man? But see, Judas, not Judas, but Thomas, the twin, was absent that day. Amen. We don't know where he was. Scripture does not tell us where he was. But he was somewhere other than that place of seclusion where they had been hiding out since Jesus had died on the cross. Jesus immediately rebuked the ten because they did not believe the early reports of him being risen and alive. See, Mary had first come and told them where the tomb is empty. His body is not there, but when she had talked to Jesus, she came back and told them, I have seen Jesus. But Jesus rebuked them because they did not believe. And many people today in 2020, is, as we see the way that the world is sinning, many people even today don't even know about Jesus. And many don't believe that he rose from the dead. See, that's what our Christian faith is based upon. We believe that Jesus got up. We believe that Jesus has gone back to him. We believe that Jesus is going to come back again and receive us to himself. But these disciples had walked with Jesus. They seen him perform miracles. They had seen him, a man, turn water into wine. They had witnessed him taking two fishes and five body loaves and feeding 5,000. Saw him another time, a man, taking seven loaves and, and borrowing some more fish to go along with and fed 4,000. They witnessed the lady of the issue of blood touching him and, and, and being made whole. They witnessed him giving, putting sight into a blind man's eyes. They witnessed him touching a, a lady's son in a funeral procession that he set up in a funeral procession. But their faith was not where it should have been as they walked with Jesus. Amen. But Mark 16, 14 tells us, he spoke firm to them because they had no faith. He was firm. He was disappointed. They would not believe those who had seen him after he rose from the dead. The resurrection should produce determination. Now the disciples had seen physical proof and confirmation that Jesus had risen from the dead. He was standing right there before them. He risen from the dead in the belly of hell. Jesus now commissioned them to leave their hideout and seclusion to do ministry when he spoke these words. He said to them, go into all the world, preach the good news to everyone. He was saying that don't just preach this gospel to a select few. Just don't preach this gospel to church folks. Just don't limit this gospel to save folks. Don't just limit this gospel to folks that look like you, but preach this gospel to those that don't look like you. Preach this gospel to those who don't speak like you. 
Amen. Go into all the world, teaching them to observe everything that I have taught you. And then when you have taught them the word, say, baptizing them, amen, in the name of Jesus, that they would be saved and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Being that only this part of creation of which only saved Christians can respond to Jesus' commissioning to go into the world, we the called out church has responsibility and calling to go and tell the unsaved in the world about our risen Christ. We have the responsibility as the called out church. However, we don't do it, who else is going to do it? We have that responsibility. We cannot just sit around and talk about how people are sinning and uh, uh, how we was raised up by Big Mama and, and what we used to do and how bad the world is now. We need to use that energy to make known to people that Jesus Christ is alive. That now, now we don't worship him in his physical presence, but that he is a spirit, and that presently we worship him in spirit and in truth. The resurrection should produce determination. Therefore, we save Christians are commanded to use and employ our faith to use our obedience to find the word of God. And our good works all combined into one package to spread this gospel of Jesus to the entire inhabited world. As Matthew 28, 19 through 20 tells us, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. See, that is the gospel, to the very end of the age. Jesus informs the disciples when they step out on faith as a lady with the blood issues, they will be able to perform supernatural miracles, defying signs and human belief. Jesus informs his disciples that though faith in him and his resurrection in him defeat in death, they would be able to, according to their faith, they would be able to speak and prophesy and unlearn foreign languages and tongues. If we would forward over to the day of Pentecost, when the disciples were in this particular upper room in Jerusalem, as scripture tells us, the Holy Spirit came in that room, came in with a loud sound, the sound of mighty rushing winds. And he lighted upon every one of them in the symbolism of cloven tongues of fire. And when the he, the Holy Spirit, light upon them, scriptures say they began to speak in languages other than their own native Galilean tongues. They say as the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak 
as he put in their mouth the words that God wanted them to speak. And when he had done this, people on the outside, from all corners of the globe and world, began to hear and understand and respond to the word of God. Many on that particular day accepted Christ as their Lord, Savior, and Master, as Peter preached, amen, later on following that commotion, that room, and, and 3,000 souls got saved that day because they heard the word of God and they believed and they got saved. Peter told us many that believed in him would be Say that's what it takes. If you confess your mouth to the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. See, it's by faith that we are saved. And then uh, Jesus found disciples that through their faith, they will even have so much power, they could pick up the most poisonous and venomous snakes who bite them, and they won't die. Amen. Because we read about Peter. Uh, when they had arrived to the island of Malta, when their ship had been wrecked and decimated, and some got to the shore, some by swimming. Some had to hold on to plank wood from the ship. Some by other things that floated, they hung on to, and they got to the island of Malta. And when Peter and the other men with him, I'm perhaps 175 other men that were with Peter on that ship. And the island people welcomed them and built them a fire. As Peter was getting more firewood to keep the fire hot, Peter picked up a piece of firewood. And, and under that wood was a viper snake, perhaps one of the most part of the snakes known to the world. And Peter, by the power of God that was in him, he just shook the snake off in the fire. And the island people were looking at Peter, expecting him to die. Because when a, a viper bites you, you only have, you have perhaps less than five minutes of life left in you. Because he causes your blood to lose its coagulation ability and you die. But Peter did not die because Peter had the Holy Spirit operating on the inside of him. And then by having faith, Jesus informed that they'll be to lay their hands on sick folks and to heal them. Peter, a man, we had so much Holy Spirit in him that when people walked by him and walked into the shadow of Peter, Scripture informs us that they were healed when the shadow of Peter would just fall upon their bodies. And, and whatever sickness they had, they would be healed. See, that works today, but we got to have that level of faith. Jesus, now having spoken his last words to his disciples, he's taken up into heaven. They watch Jesus go up into the clouds as heaven opened her doors to welcome Jesus back home for that home coming celebration that he would be in his father's house preparing our mansions and to prepare them and he would come again and to receive us to himself. But Mark 16, 19 said, after the Lord Jesus spoke to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. 
So Jesus, sitting on the right hand of God, marks the beginning of his heavenly ministry for us. John writes to us that we will not sin, and the word of God has a covering for us when we unintentionally sin against God. Amen. He won't compute this sin because 1 John 2, 1 say, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In other words, an advocate means someone who speaks up for you. Someone who goes, a man, into a court and put your case before the judge, a man, to get you delivered from whatever fault that you might have. So when we walk by faith, Jesus becomes our advocate. As some old digger said, he's your lawyer, a man, in a courtroom. And that's who Jesus becomes for us when we let go of sin. And then step out on faith, giving ourselves totally and completely to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. After Jesus' ascension, going back to God, disciples go and preach the gospel everywhere. They prophesy on the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches and 3,000 souls are saved. With that being said, therefore, what should Jesus' the resurrection, amen, mean for us? How does that affect us, amen? We should, we should be prompted to rededicate our lives to Almighty God. Then Jesus' resurrection gives us confirmation that Jesus Christ is not dead, that he is truly alive. And Jesus' resurrection should produce a determination in us to worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. Uh, God's Jesus' resurrection produced in us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all of our mind, which is the first and great commandment. And then we should also adhere to the second one, which is almost just like it. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. See, this is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. And this, my brothers and sisters, is how Jesus' resurrection should affect us. If we believe that Jesus got up on that third day morning, and when we believe, amen, that we receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon us and we be witnesses, then that gives us a greater determination to walk by faith and not by sight and to know assuredly without any doubt that Jesus Christ is coming back one day. Without a doubt, we know he's coming back on a cloud. Amen. Amen. A man to rapture up the church. We know without a doubt that we'll be caught up in that moment in the twinkling of an eye. We know without a doubt that at the last trumpet sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. We know without a doubt that all of us who are still alive when this rapture, a man, is in process that we will also be taken up for those who died in Christ. And all of us together will be forever with the Lord. 
and that we will go before his judgment seat. And and once we uh, are judged, amen, to be righteous before the Lord in our walk in the world, then we will receive our crown of righteousness, which God, the righteous judge, will crown us. We bless you and we praise you right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you for Jesus. Father, bless us right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this word, Father. We thank you that you have shown us how we have been blessed by the shed blood of Jesus. We thank you that we will no longer be like we was before this lesson, that we will have a greater determination to walk like Jesus, to talk like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus. Father, we bless us right now. Give us traveling grace until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you, Lord. Thank you.